Well, sometimes truth really is stranger than fiction. This is going to be hard for many of you to believe, but the transformation of Alan Dershowitz seems almost complete. He is now representing my pillow CEO and founder Mike Lindell. Now, when I say transformation in the interview, we're going to look at shortly. Dershowitz says he's still a liberal Democrat who voted for Biden, but that he's getting involved in these cases because of the principles, the legal principles, etc. It is a cartoonish mess that pillow is. And then you add Dershowitz to it, and it is just some kind of very strange uh, 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 salad of some kind. I don't even know what words to apply to it. Here is Dershowitz saying he is going to ask for a special master for the pillow cell phone. It's every single one of these things couldn't be a bigger joke. Remember that Mike Pillow's phone was seized by the FBI at a Hardee's drive through not long ago. And here is Pillow interviewing his new lawyer, Alan Dershowitz. Issue the subpoena for the telephone so that they could get and search the telephone and where completely. Is and what we're seeking is what uh, President Trump got in the Mar-a-Lago case, the appointment of uh, uh, a special uh, investigator to look into this or return of the cell phone, because the the search was a general search, the kind of general search that the framers of our Constitution um, wanted to specifically outlaw in the Fourth Amendment. Now, Dershowitz is a lawyer and so are Trump's lawyers, Alina Habba and Christina Bob and all those people. They made the same argument after the search warrant was executed at Mar-a-Lago. They said this was a fishing expedition. It was general. They sort of took everything. There was no discretion. This is unconstitutional. And then, of course, it didn't actually turn out that any judge or court agreed with them. Here is an interview on the Law and Crime Network, wherein Alan Dershowitz explains why are you working for Mike Pillow? Now, the answer might be because Mike Pillow has a lot of money. That might be the real answer. I don't know. But take a listen to some of this. Well, thank you. First of all, let me tell you why I'm representing Mike Lindell. I agree with him about very little. I think the election was fair. I think he's wrong in challenging uh, the election. Um, we're on completely different sides. I'm a liberal Democrat. I voted for Biden. He's a conservative Republican. I think it's a critically important for people on my side of the political fence, people who are Biden supporters, supporters of the election, to hold the Justice Department accountable for trying to target our political enemies. I think the criticism should come from within our party, not only outside the party. So I'm very anxious to defend the Constitution on behalf of Mike Lindell, the search itself was clearly a general search. That OK, and then he makes the same point we heard him make in the earlier segment. Now, listen, he, here's the story with this. If how can I say this? The fact that it took this long for there to be any action given Trump's consistent wrongdoing year after year after year tells us that if there were really any biased interest in how this went down. It's that the FBI and DOJ were too reluctant to get involved in going after Trump. So what Pillow and Trump and Dershowitz want us to believe is the fact that these things happened at all, that there was the raid on Mar-a-Lago, that there was the seizure of Pillow's cell phone. The fact that these things happened at all is indicative of political bias and attempts at political retribution. There has been so much wrongdoing that the way I see it is the fact that it took this long suggests they were really reluctant and they wanted to be really careful and really sure. And of course, all the evidence we have points that way. When you look at the search warrant for the uh, uh, for Mar-a-Lago, when you look at the fact that the attorney general signed off, the FBI director signed off, a judge signed off. Everything was made just so. And it didn't really matter to the Trumpists because they still said it was illegal. It's a political witch hunt, all these different things. They'll say that either way. But so far, no court has found that any of those arguments have merit. My expectation is that courts will similarly find that Dershowitz's arguments about the pillow phone seizure 
pillow phone seizure. Those are the terms we're using will also be without merit. That's my expectation. We will watch and we will see the continued bad news for the failed former president, Donald Trump. In a, an appeals court now says the Department of Justice can resume its criminal probe of the classified documents that were obtained at Mar-a-Lago. Remember, once that search warrant was executed and the documents were taken, um, seized, the uh, Trump side said we need a special master. There's medical documents in there. Uh, there's privileged documents in there. Special master's got to look at all of it and, you know, classified, declassified, just a complete and total mess. We are now moving beyond that. As CNN reports, a federal appeals court is allowing the Justice Department to continue looking at those documents marked classified, seized from Trump. The emergency intervention upends a trial judge's order over those documents that had blocked federal investigators work on the documents and is a strong rebuke of the Trump team's attempt to suggest without evidence that materials were somehow declassified. Remember what happened. The special master said, listen, if you're going to make this argument about classification, then make it and we're going to move on very quickly if you don't, because the special master said, which I told you uh, two days ago, you give me a document that says top secret and you don't present any evidence that it was declassified. That's it. Essentially a cut the crap moment. And that is exactly what is going on here. The ruling was issued by a three judge panel of the 11th U.S. Circuit of uh, Court of Appeals. Two of the three judges were nominated by Donald Trump. This is supposed to be quite a conservative court. And it really goes to show that the arguments Trump was making in public were completely and totally absurd. Um, perhaps the funniest line from the entire thing is, quote, for our part, we cannot discern why the plaintiff would have an individual interest in or need for any of the 100 documents with classification markings. And that sort of says it all. We can't figure that out as well. It was for Trump's memoirs. He doesn't read or write. Trump wanted to review the documents. He doesn't read or write. They were for Trump's library. The library is not even something Trump is really thinking of, according to many insiders. There's just no reasonable explanation other than bad ones. He wanted to sell them. He wanted to use them as leverage. Horrible, horrible things that border on treason. The judges couldn't understand it either. So the investigation continues. There is now an indictment watch taking place. We'll see where we are another month or two from now. Let's look at um, here's a question that we've been asking for a while. And that question is, are all of these investigations into Trump going to hurt his approval rating? And on the one hand, if approval reacted to the real world, the answer would be it sure as hell should look at all of the legal trouble and wrongdoing that we've learned about just in the last six weeks about Donald Trump. But when you're dealing with a cult, it doesn't always work that way. And indeed, Trump support remains unmoved by investigations, poll finds. This is in The New York Times is the upshot. And it says even during peak crises during his presidency, views of him were static. Post presidency polls have continued the trend. The American public's view of Trump is remarkably stable across a number of different measures in recent months, even as he faces multiple investigations and remains a central figure in the midterm elections. This is a New York Times Siena College poll, and it finds 44 percent of voters view Trump favorably, 53 percent view him unfavorably. The recent poll was fielded early this month after news of the Justice Department's inquiry into Trump's handling of confidential documents, but before yesterday, uh, the day before yesterday's lawsuit announcement. The level of Trump support has effectively been unchanged since the last poll in July, which was during the January 6th committee hearings. This is a cult, folks, and that is what we should expect. In, think about it. Uh, Jim Jones People's Temple. This is the you know drink the Kool-Aid disaster that we now uh, know about uh, and that we've known about for decades. I should say it's not it's not recent news. If you went to the followers of Jim Jones and you said he's under investigation for sexual assault and he's under investigation for embezzlement and he's under investigation for tax evasion. And we have pretty good evidence on all of it. 
Do you think that Jim Jones followers would have said, oh, well, then I'm no I'm not behind him anymore? No, because it was a cult. And that is how cult leaders work. When you don't care about reality to start your support of Trump, reality isn't going to dissuade you from your support of Trump. And when he said I could shoot someone on Fifth Avenue and I wouldn't lose support, he wasn't wrong. That's exactly right. And if he did shoot someone on Fifth Avenue, we all know how it would go. It would be well, he was provoked. It was self-defense. There was a violent Antifa or BLM member who was doing something to Trump. That's how it would go. It wouldn't necessarily be. It's great that he shot someone, although you probably would be able to find that. Uh, you'd probably find some people who say that the person he shot was one of those pedophiles that QAnon is fighting against or whatever. But for the most part, people will go, no, 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 it was self-defense. You got to understand the circumstances. And he's there's threats to his life all the time. He reasonably feared for it and all. He's absolutely right when he said I would be able to shoot someone on Fifth Avenue and not lose any support. So it shouldn't surprise us that Trump's approval hasn't diminished at all. But it raises questions about what happens with Trump ism in 2022 and in 2024 which will be something we look at extensively in the next few weeks leading up to these uh, midterm elections, which are now imminent. We're now looking at looking at what is it, five and a half, uh, six weeks or so from now. Make sure that you're following me on Twitter at Pacman and let me know what you think. Is there anything at this point that could erode Trump's support among the core supporters that are mostly everything that he has left or all that he has left, better said? Don't forget that the best way to support the David Pakman show is by becoming a member, which gives you access to the daily bonus show, the regular show with no commercials. You also get access to our entire archive of every episode dating back a really long time and plenty of other awesome membership perks. Go to joinpacman.com and use the coupon code better 21 for a huge discount. Joinpacman.com. The David Pakman Show is, of course, a community funded program. We depend on the gracious and generous support of so many in our audience. You can sign up at joinpacman.com. You will get access to the bonus show. You will get access to the daily commercial free audio and video feeds of the show. You will be invited to the members only town halls and have priority access to the uh, regular town halls. There are so many great benefits that you can take advantage of by signing up at joinpacman.com. Let's hear from the most important people in the audience, and those are the viewers and the listeners. We'll take some calls now from our discord at davidpacman.com slash discord, starting with I hope I pronounced this correctly, Rahman from Minneapolis. Welcome. Did I did I pronounce that OK? Yes, you did, David. How are you doing? I'm doing well. Good. A uh, long time viewer. Been watching your show since high school. Wow. Thank you. My question is, um, with everything that's been going on the last two years, do you believe the Pro Republican Party is trying to reinstitute a 21st century version of Jim Crow? Well, most of them don't even know what that is. So I would say not conscious. I don't think they're using Jim Crow as a model, but I do think that they are reacting with a lot of the same instincts where as they're increasingly frustrated that the law doesn't allow them to do certain things they want to do, they're trying to find ways around it to achieve essentially the same outcomes, if that makes sense. And that includes when it comes to immigration policy, this includes with it, when it comes to educational policy and, you know, this idea of get rid of the Department of Education, different things like that. The impact of a lot of those things would be similar to the impact of, of uh, some of the things in place during the Jim Crow era. So in that sense, I would say, yeah, to some degree. Yeah, because when you see when you look back in the history books and you, you could see the parallels uh, with, uh, with people going against the LGBT community, going with the voter restriction, yep. the anti-abortion laws. When you look at Illinois, what happened with Mary Miller, and she she was at, she was saying this is a victory for white life. Yep. That, the, 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 that was coded language. I, I agree with you 100 percent, 100 percent. And 
really all we can do is try to ensure that the people who want to do this stuff don't get into positions of power. Sadly, many of them are already in positions of power, but at every opportunity to vote, let's try to prevent more of them from being voted in. OK, that was my only question. Thank you for taking my call, David. All right. Thank you, Rahman from Minneapolis. Very much appreciate the call. Let's go next to Lucas from Massachusetts. Lucas, welcome to the show. What's on your mind today? Hey, David. Hi. Uh, I didn't, I'm ecstatic right now because I didn't get to um, a- ask my question last week. But here's my question. Please. So a lot of people are optimistic about the war in Ukraine because of the Ukrainians' advances. I'm not, and here's why. Okay. I think that I worry that if the GOP takes back Congress, they will block Ukraine funding and side with Putin. What do you think? I think they almost certainly will. Now, just as a heads up, you've got discord notifications blinging in the background, and that is a faux pas during the phone call. Okay. so if you can get those turned off, that would be really great. I think you were absolutely correct. And when the if Republicans get the opportunity to stop the funding to Ukraine, they will do it um, under the guise of we have to take care of America first. That's what they're saying. And of course, many people will look at it and say, this is another way that you're playing soft with Putin. And they'll say it's not about playing soft with Putin. It's about we need to deal with crime and immigration and all these different things. And of course, we can walk and chew gum at the same time. But yeah, they will they will try to at least cut funding to Ukraine. And that's the type of explanation that they'll give. All right. Thank you for as, as answering my question. I've heard a lot of different perspectives on it. I'm glad to hear yours. All right, Lucas, thank you very much. You're welcome. All right, there we go. Um, OK, let's go next to Alan from Miami, Florida. Alan, welcome. Alan, you are on the air, but it looks like you have the wrong microphone selected. Welcome to the program. You can speak if you can get configured correctly. And last chance for Alan from Miami, Florida, who is in tech hell, as we might call it. Welcome, Alan. Hello. Can you hear me? Now I can hear you. How are you, David? I'm doing well. Good, good. Um, So I had a question about EVs. I find EVs very interesting. and I know you've talked about them um, in the past on several occasions. So um, now, as you probably know, the biggest issue with EVs um, from a from a cost standpoint is the the most expensive part, right? Which is the battery, and more specifically, the materials sourced and used to manufacture these batteries. Yes, right. And if you look at the trajectory of EV prices, so EV vehicles, um, their prices, um, they have been going down, but um, the price of these of these batteries um, are still a big impediment, right? Yes. So what do you think maybe the government can do? What kind of role do you think or positive role um, do you think the government can play um, in trying to resolve this issue or helping to resolve this issue? And the reason I ask is because, you know, a lot of people in the EV space will say that the, the biggest impediment for the middle class or let's say just regular folk being able to afford an EV um, is this issue basically is, is the cost of the materials to manufacture the batteries. So there's a couple different things here. First of all, in terms of what the government can do, that's not the most interesting question to me because like the government can do what it's done in other industries that it wants to support rebates, subsidies, preferential tax treatment. The government has its tools that it can use, and I'm fine with the government doing that. I think the problem you're pointing out is going to resolve itself with more electric vehicle uh, demand. And as as adoption increases, I mean, listen, it's like when you look at um, uh, computer processors, right? And you look at I remember when we got from Radio Shack this 100 megahertz Pentium computer and it was like twenty five hundred dollars in whatever year that was, which is like a lot more money now, you know, it's probably five or six grand now. And now you get, you know, multi gigahertz processors for way less by some of the same um, uh, laws that govern the reduced price of hard drive storage and the reduced cost of processing power. I think you're going to see absolutely the same thing with uh, with electric vehicle batteries. Um, The other thing is communicating to people that because electric vehicles are so much more efficient 
than internal combustion engines on a per mile basis. It's also possible that while the upfront cost of an electric vehicle can be higher, are the, although those costs are also coming down, the long term costs, because the electricity is cheaper than the gas and the efficiency is higher, so your cost per mile is lower, the total cost of ownership is, is going to be less. So I think it's a matter of we've got to communicate that that's already the case. The prices will continue to come down. Battery recycling and reuse is going to be developed. All of these things are these are really engineering problems that are that are like what we saw in computing and in other spaces. It's all going to get resolved, is my view. OK, I see. Well, it seems to me that that as far as you mentioned uh, recycling, that's a huge thing that many companies are trying to, to push is to try to get um, these batteries to kind of get back into the, the life cycle because yep. they still have valuable uh, use. But it seems and I could be wrong here, maybe you can correct me on this, but it seems like I don't know if the government or federal government has any sort of program to recycle or incentivize recycling of these things, because that I don't know. We'll they may, they may or they may not. Yeah. So that that could be an area maybe to, that, that, that sort of the government can can uh, can address, because so far right now, it seems like it's just startups that are coming out of nowhere that are trying to resolve that issue and the government isn't doing much. I would like the way. government uh, to more uh, incentivizing this uh, technology development, but it's happening, Alan. It's all happening. Oh, cool. thank you. Well, that's right. it. Have thank all, you for the call. Appreciate it. Alan from Miami, Florida, quite a scene down there that I can tell you for sure. Let's go. Oh, just a reminder for everybody waiting in discord to chat with me. If your nickname is anything other than a name and a location, uh, whether it's nicknames or single words or whatever the case may be, uh, jokes, you're not going to get called on, which is fine if you're just listening. But just so you know why you won't be getting called on. Let's go next to Moshe from Toronto, Canada. Welcome. Hello, David. Hello. Hello. Um, so I was wondering, I don't know how how invested you are in uh Canadian politics, but I was wondering if I could get your opinion on how well you think uh, Justin Trudeau has been doing over the last while, and and your opinion about the uh, the uh, the new uh, Conservative Party leader, Conservative Party leader Pierre Polyev, who just won the uh, um, who just won the race for Conservative Party leader. You know, I think it wouldn't be appropriate for me to comment, not because I think it's inappropriate to comment on foreign leaders but because there are just so many people who follow it much more closely than I do that I couldn't possibly give you a very informed take. I will say I recently when I was in Montreal uh, met with and chatted with um, MP Anthony Housefather, who likes what Trudeau is doing, but they're in the same party. Right. So he may have a dog in that fight, so to speak. Um, but no, I don't I don't I, I don't think I'm informed enough to really be saying, hey, listen to my opinion about Canadian politics. Yeah, well, they, they, the MPs will always vote for the people in their party, no matter what. Pretty much, that's pretty much how it works. Mm -hmm. Well, tell me, I mean, how do you think things are day to day in Toronto? Well, I mean, yeah, we're, we're dealing with uh, the cost of living being in a, in a pretty terrible place right now. Mm -hmm. um, um, the government's working on getting them to clear in place, which which is interesting. The question, I guess, is the question. I, I don't I wonder what you would think is is. Uh, if now is the right time to start implementing like these these uh, high cost uh, programs um, at this point where we're, everyone is trying to like save money, reduce inflation, you know, you said a dental care program. Yeah, yeah. They want to start they want to start doing a federal program where you get coverage from the government for uh, for dental care, because up until now, it's it's com uh, that's completely been uh, private and only only paid for by private insurance. Well, listen, again, without commenting specifically about what's going on in Canada, there are always people who will say this is the wrong time to do anything that involves spending money. But my view tends to be when it comes to things like health care, why would you wait? People, the, the sooner people get care, the better off we are. Uh huh. Even if that means risking um, the, um, like the money being like that money being spent elsewhere. Well, you'd have to then say, well, what else do you want to spend it on and compare? Oh, I would say not spend, <laughs> not spend it at all uh, as of uh, uh, as of this current moment. Yeah. OK. All right. Well, I'd like to see the numbers on it. But again, I'm, I'm not the best position to comment on that. OK. All right. Thank you for your time. All right. Thanks, Moshe from Toronto. Great to hear from you. 
Let's go. Uh, let's go next to Brandon from North Carolina. Brandon, welcome to the program. Brandon from North Carolina, you are muting yourself right now. It's a self mute. As soon as you unmute yourself, you'll be able to talk. hear me. Yes, I can. Hello, David. Nice to talk to you. Likewise. Let's go, Brandon. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I just was wanting to ask you. Uh, Whoa, Brandon, so- Brandon, wait a second. You're, you're shot out of a cannon. Can you move the microphone a little bit further from your mouth? Of course. Sorry. That's better. That's smoother. I like that. Okay. Is that okay? So you can hear me better? Yeah, much better. Okay. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I was wanting to ask you, so what's your, uh, mind, uh, think about, um, the whole Alvin Bragg not wanting to prosecute Trump on, uh, his finances? I have not read much about that. Is Alvin Bragg was that the New York DA that it led to two investigators quitting because they were like, this is going nowhere. Our work is pointless. Yeah, uh, the, uh, he's the Southern District. Ah, I see it here. Yeah. Listen, at the time when that was that was news. It seemed to me that it was obvious that that was going on to some degree. We've been saying for a while, it seems that nobody wants to be the first to prosecute Trump. And we'll see if federal charges end up being the first thing. Here's my view on it. If the facts say that a prosecution is correct, not prosecuting is a cop out and it's cowardly. Now, that being said, that being said, we only want to bring charges against anyone, random people or a former president when the evidence supports it. So it's not prosecute Trump because I think Trump's a terrible president. It's If that's what the evidence says should be done, it should be done. And not doing it is a real problem. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Uh, How are things otherwise in North Carolina? uh, uh, Pretty good. Other than uh, besides our roads and infrastructure and stuff, pretty good. But um, other than that, um, pretty good. Uh, Beasley's ahead in polls, so... As long as we don't elect Bud, what's wrong with good. the roads? Is it like potholes or what? Yeah, potholes. Like our roads are pretty much just like crumbling. You can literally just see the wear on them. Like it's just you can just tear, see the the wear and tear on them. It's pretty bad. That's horrible. That's horrible. All right, Brandon. Well, thank you for the call. Thank you very much. Take it easy, David. You too. There's Brandon from North Carolina. Let's take a quick break and get right back to the callers. If you're holding on to talk to me, hold on just a moment longer because we're going right back to the phones. If you value what we do at the David Pakman show, remember to support us on Patreon. Go to patreon.com slash David Pakman show where you can get access to behind the scenes videos, the daily bonus show, the commercial free daily show as well as special discounts on merch, including hats, hoodies, mugs and T-shirts. You can support the show for as little as two dollars a month. Check it out at Patreon dot com slash David Pakman show. Let's speak to a few more people. We take calls via discord on Fridays at David Pakman dot com slash discord. That's the place to do it. Let's go to Harry from Columbus, Ohio. Harry, what's going on there? Can you hear me well? Uh, I can hear you. Let's put it that way. Okay, I'll be very brief then. I'm very excited for your new finance channel. I saw you drop your first video yesterday. We uh, now have multiple, multiple videos on the finance channel. The uh, audience is responding sort of mildly positively, which I think is as good as you can hope for on the Internet, you know? Yeah, I agree. So I'll, I'll be real quick. Okay. Now, I know very, very little about, you know, buying a house, securing my assets, anything like that. Yep. With the recent raises in interest rates from the Fed, does it make any sense to buy a house until those come down? Like, I have no idea what calculations I need to make before. Well, here's the general thing. Give me a tiny bit of advice. Yeah, that's it. Thank you so much. Here's the general thing. Okay. as a general rule, and we have a clip coming out on the finance channel about this, when interest rates go up, 
home prices come down. They tend to move in opposite directions. Now, it's not always literally true. Sometimes interest rates going up might just mean home prices are steady instead of going down. But the idea is interest rates and prices move in opposite directions. And I I explain why in a clip on the finance channel, which will be out very soon. So if you were in a position to buy a home cash, high interest rate environments can be good moments to do that. Now, of course, if you're selling and buying, often you're you're subject to the same the same market conditions that make buying attractive might make you have to sell your house for less. So it really depends on the market and your personal situation and whether you're only looking to buy or buying and selling. But the principle at play is in general, interest rates up, houses down. Yeah, it seems like I'm going to have to make a pretty, you know, big finance, sorry, a pretty big mortgage change to get into uh, a house. So it doesn't seem like it's going to be the right time for me. I just right. wanted to. If you, have, a, if you have a mortgage at two and a half percent right now, and in the new place, you would need a mortgage at five percent, it may not be the right time for you. That's perfectly reasonable. Hello. OK, thank you for the call. Very much appreciated. Mortgage rates, complicated stuff, complicated stuff which we absolutely will be dealing with on the finance channel. Let's go to Rob from Massachusetts. Rob, welcome to the show. Hi, thank you. Uh, first time on. Uh, I have a really quick question. Sure. Um, I have a right wing friend at work and he tends to like comment on, on YouTube things I post. Uh, and the thing is I've learned to think like he does. So there's like a little version of him in my head. Mm. Um, like trying to be a written person. And I wonder if that happens to you, if you find it useful for arguments or if it's just like frustrating because you know that like they might bury themselves in the way. No, that's real. It's really good and it's useful. And, and I would argue that it's actually quite healthy, which is OK. We see a headline uh, gas prices down two months in a row. I think it's great to say, OK, how are how are Republicans going to react to this? Do they have a point? If so, should I modify my view? If not, why is it that they're actually wrong? I mean, maybe gas prices is a, is a bad example, but I think that that's actually very healthy. It's it's arguably a version of steel manning, which is rather than straw manning your political opponents, you steel man and say, what's the best case I can make for their view? And if I still think it's a bad case, it reinforces that I've come to the right conclusion. I think that's very healthy as long as it doesn't become like intrusive or pathological. Oh, great. Yeah, I listen to Sam Harris, so you steel manning. So that's, I never thought of it that way. Thank you. All right, Rob. Thank you very much. That that last bit was a little garbled. I didn't understand that, but I did understand. Thank you. And I really do appreciate that. We're taking calls via discord just as a reminder to everybody waiting to chat with me. If you actually want the opportunity to talk, your nickname in the waiting lobby on Discord needs to be your name and where you're calling from or where you're calling from and your name. A lot of people with nicknames are not going to get called on. OK, just as just as a heads up. So everybody understands that. Let's go next to Tristan from Boston. Tristan, welcome. Hey, David, what's up? How are you? I'm feeling OK. Good. So. Um, my question would be, you remember a while back the, uh, detective work by that American muckrakers pack is what ended up getting, uh, Madison Cawthorn fired. Uh, well, you think we'll yeah, ever- I mean, I don't here. know that Cawthorn lost only because of the salacious stuff released about him. I, I don't know. But I remember the I remember the American muck, muckrakers pack and the stuff that they released. Certainly. Yes. Do you think we'll hear from them again in actually succeeding in smearing someone enough to get them out of Congress? So I don't remember if it was the same people who tried with Lauren Boebert and it didn't go anywhere because it wasn't very well sourced or if that was a different organization. I just don't remember offhand, but it's sort of a question about a prediction. I have no idea. I don't know if they have dirt on someone else, but it's certainly conceivable that we would. The site fire Boebert is still up and I assume it will be up for as long as it takes for her to 
leave Congress. Fair. But, All right. Well, uh, we will keep yeah. an eye on it. Other, yeah. Other than that, the their site right now is just a bunch of criminal Republicans not looking so caught in uh, not so hot poses. Fair. So I guess it's what the best we can hope for for now. All right, Stay Tristan. Very good. Better. We'll keep an eye on it. Cool. Thanks. All right, Tristan from Boston with a very important declaration. Let's go next to Philip from Germany. Philip, welcome. Hello, hello. Uh, Can you hear me well? So I can hear you. There is a static hiss in the background whenever you talk. Okay, I don't really know why. But my main question is that basically back in the times of the Civil War, the roles of the Democratic and Republican Party were kind of reversed, where the Democrats were the one with with the slaves and Abraham Lincoln was from the Republicans, were freeing the slaves and so on. And nowadays, well, it's all kind of in reverse, especially when you have confederate flags being waved at january 6 and all that and you have an idea how that reversal came to be yeah there's actually been multiple reversals and i think that you know oh, well. this can be very confusing even to americans so my advice on this issue is to think about it in the following way the right wing was in favor of owning slaves and the party name that was the uh, correct name at the time is less relevant than the fact that it was the political right that wanted the slaves and the political, quite frankly, center and left and even to some degree center right that did not. And that makes it so you don't have to remember when the party realignments took place. Okay, but still kind of weird that the Republicans were center or or perhaps even center left. Not sure. Well, remember, not all of Lincoln's Republicans, not all of Lincoln's Republicans wanted to end slavery. That's that's Lincoln did, but not the entire Republican Party did not want to. Also interesting, I guess. But yeah, it kind of happens to go that way that basically the Democrats were were hardline into slaves and. Yeah, Lincoln's direction was, yeah, against the slaves. Yeah, I would even want to double check that because I don't even know for sure that 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 it's that Democrats were into slaves. Let, let me double check because there were multiple parties at the time. But I'm going to let you go because that hissing is just so bad. OK. Oh, sorry. Okay. Right, no problem. No problem. All right, good. We'll get that figured out for next time. But that is that is quite an audio element that was taking place there. Let's go next to Alex from California. Alex, welcome. Hey, David, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Hey, David. So um, have you covered the 60 second, 60 minute interview from Joe Biden and about Taiwan? I covered the interview in terms of Biden saying that the pandemic is over. I did not cover the Taiwan piece. I was so busy um, early in the week that I didn't even watch the entire interview. I just did a story on the the, uh, COVID part. Okay, so um, I'm curious because every time Joe Biden says something about Taiwan, like if China invades, we're going to send troops. But every time that happens, it always seems that the White House always backs pedal and say, oh, uh, we don't know about that or, oh, uh, we don't stand by that. Um, what do you think about that? I think it's typical posturing. It's you, 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 you say something. The president says something a little hawkish. And then we're, when there's a request for a clarification, you sort of walk back a little bit and say it's not our intent or it's not what was meant. I think that that is, that is completely standard political posturing to sort of keep those that you consider your adversaries a little bit on balance where it's not totally clear exactly what they're willing to do. It's like a minor version of when Putin talks about launching nukes. Um, I, I think it's just typical posturing, but it's politics. Right. So um, if let's say somehow or for some reason China does invade Taiwan. Yes. Do you do you believe that uh, America should step in with their like not just like what sending funding to Taiwan, but like sending troops like American troops to like how about Taiwan? I am not ready at this point in time to say that the U.S. should get involved militarily in defense of Taiwan against China. I believe that China would be wrong to invade Taiwan, of course, but I am very careful about declaring support for American military interventions. So right now, I can't tell you that I would support that. I would have to study the issue more. That's fair. But like, I feel like if 
you know, China does invade Taiwan, it, I feel like that would set like a bad precedent if America doesn't do something because like you can't, Ukraine is doing well because we're sending a bunch of aid to, um, to their way. But uh, in the case of like China and Taiwan, I feel like this is like a really different situation. Yeah, the scale you know? is completely different and the circumstances are completely different. Listen, I agree. I think that military action would ideally happen in coalition. And um, I am not at this point ready to say uh, that I would say, yes, the U.S. needs to get in there. Um, one final thing. Um, do you believe that um, people are people are comparing like the China Taiwan situation to Russian Ukraine and saying how um, how Russian is doing poorly and how things are not going in Russia's favor during the war. And people believe that that might reflect or might be the um, same situation if China invades Taiwan. Because I, I think that that is a totally different situation. I do not think it is logical to extrapolate from how Ukraine is doing. Uh, how Taiwan would do. I, I don't think that that would be a fair um, assess, a fair assumption. OK, um, so that's fair. That's all, David. Dave for, thank you for taking my call. All right. Thank you, Alex from California. Very, very important declaration. Let's go to Grant from Iowa City, Iowa. Grant, welcome to the program. What's on your mind today? Uh, hey, David, um, I saw your interview with uh, Ben Dixon yesterday. It was really interesting. Thank you. Um, yeah, it's clear that uh, the Christian nationalist movement is definitely growing or at least becoming more bold. Yes. Um, and so I was just wondering, I know I don't know if you identify as like agnostic or atheist, I'm not sure. But so I don't know how much um, interaction like personally you've had with um, evangelical conservative Christians. But do you think um, not the politicians, but like just like general people in public, um, do you think they're motivated more by um, a desire for power or are they motivated more by fear? Um, cause personally, in my experience, I kind of grew up in that kind of, you know, realm. <laughs> and uh, I think there's a there's a great fear they have. Uh, I they're agree. just like afraid of like God punishing them. So I don't yeah, know what you I, uh, my my most extensive interactions with American evangelicals was when I went to Indiana because my girlfriend has family there and the my my girlfriend's Jewish, but is she has a part of her family that's evangelical Christians. And what I saw in speaking to them, a lot of fear and a lot of fear driven conspiratorial beliefs. And it did not feel to me like now I'm not talking about politicians. I'm talking about random people, which was your question. It did not feel right, like right. A, a thirst for power was their guiding light. It genuinely seemed like it was fear. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's just interesting to me because I think um just in my own experience, like when I went to college and stuff and just had, you know, classes where we were looking at other uh, just groups in the world, I was like, oh, um, this is not that scary. <laughs> and uh, right. there's nothing really to be afraid of. And, and like, I don't know, even just like I, I'm still Christian, but like um, my view of like God has changed so much from what it used to be. of just like this this angry God. He wanted to punish us anytime he could. Um, so I don't know. I, I kind of think I've enjoyed talking with more conservative Christians and evangelicals um, over the last few years because I kind of like uh, just get to know how they're feeling about stuff and offer different perspectives. And for some of them, it seems like, oh, OK, um, they start to learn like it's it's not as you know horrifying as, as, as it might be, I guess, to. Um, yeah, that's really interesting to hear and that you came to that conclusion, because one of the things that I've thought about is, you know, I guess I guess I consider myself agnostic, although whenever I explain my views, people will write in and they'll say, David, you're actually an atheist, Wh whatever. Call me whatever you want. But my view is uh, I think it's completely possible that some kind of God or higher power exists. I've just not seen any evidence of it. But one of the things that I've come to believe is contrary to much of this fire and brimstone stuff from the evangelical side, if there mm -hmm. were such a higher power, it seems to me that if God created such complicated uh, human beings, God would not be this black, white, vindictive um, uh, arbiter that some uh, Christianity makes him out to be. And uh, it sounds sort of like you've come to the same idea. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So. Um... Well, yeah, I can let you get some other people now. All uh, right. But I just, Thank just you so much. I appreciate so. the call.
Yeah, thanks for taking my call. And in fact, what Grant from Iowa is letting me do is just end the segment because we are at the end of our time today. I always am just so broken up that I cannot get to everyone who's waiting to talk to me. But that means that hopefully next week some people will call in. So I will speak to you then. We'll take a quick break and be back with more right after this. Follow us on social media, interact with the David Pakman Show community, see exclusive content, see when we're taking calls live and stay up to date on other big show announcements. We post daily. Find us on Reddit, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, Discord and TikTok. All right, let's get to the Friday mailbag where you can write to me and sometimes it'll appear on the show. You can email info at davidpackman.com ideally with a substantive commentary, but sometimes there is very little substance and that's OK. I want to start today with an email from a right winger, I think, who thinks they're on to me. They, they think they know my trick. Take a look at this message. Andrew wrote to me and said, it's a nice trick. Good afternoon, sir. I noticed that you only discuss the dumbest or the dumb Republicans on your show. It's a nice trick. It's the same trick Tucker and Sean Hannity and Don Lemon and many others use. You will find no shortage of idiots on both sides of the aisle. And what you do is shine a light on just those people. Do you ever plan on having a conversation with anyone that you can't tip the outcome in your favor? If your arguments are so good, you should be able to talk to anyone, not just the pillow guy and Jesse Lee Peterson or whatever his name is. I read the comments your audience writes, and I must say that the most ignorant that they the most ignorant and misinformed people in America. And what's scary is that these people think they are the smart ones. I don't even do this for a living and I can pick apart every single one of your arguments or at least show where you are being a hypocrite. I honestly used to really like you. I know I like to hear solid arguments from both sides, but now I realize you are just a fraud. I might as well call you Hannity Jr. It's the same playbook, bro. You know, We've so first of all, they never tell you who the smart conservatives are. Tell me exactly who they are, because they go, well, Ben Shapiro. I interviewed Ben Shapiro on the show. It didn't go great for him. It wasn't like terribly humiliating, but he didn't make a lot of sense. And then he's refused all subsequent invitations. I've had Michael Knowles on the show. Some of these right wingers go, Knowles is the smart one. To the extent that Jordan Peterson is a right winger. People say, well, but Peterson's been on and he has an open invitation. We tried to get him back on recently. Uh, we had Andrew Sullivan on. He's a right winger and I find him to be intelligent. And then people, no, those aren't the right smart right wingers or they're they're not really right wingers or whatever. We we interview all sorts of people. OK, all sorts of people. This is a very boring criticism. Let's go next to Earl. Now, I'm going to be totally honest with you. I don't know if this email from Earl is satire. Earl wrote in about raising the minimum wage and said, I am so disappointed to see encouragement from your people to raise the minimum wage to fifteen dollars an hour. This could destroy capitalism as we know it, forcing millions of businesses and CEOs out of work because people are too lazy to work and too stupid to budget. I am not an economist like Thomas Sowell, but I can do simple math. So let's start. Seven twenty five an hour is two ninety a week. That's fifteen thousand eighty dollars for the year. Average health insurance is only one fifty a week. That's six hundred dollars a month. Average apartment rent for a one bedroom is only two seventy five a week. That's eleven hundred a month. Average food cost for one person is only fifty one dollars a week. Average transportation sixty five a week. Utility bills thirty five a week. So to survive, we don't need a fifteen dollar per hour minimum wage. All the person has to do is work two full time jobs and drive Uber in their spare time. I'm sure that's what Milton Friedman or Thomas Sowell would do. If this is satire, it's very well done. Um, if it's not, then it's kind of weird. But I think because I can't tell, I'll do it as a presented without comment. John wrote in. John says, hi, David, huge fan of the show, was excited to find for you to find another right winger to interview this week with John T. Smithy. I think it was I think it was John T. As a tool for your viewers to understand when confronted with the new IRS hiring goals. That 87,000 number often thrown around is misleading. This is really important because 
right wingers are loving this talking point of why does Joe Biden need 87,000 more IRS agents? Well, John explains, first of all, it's based on a proposal from May 2021 and not actually relevant to the current plan. Number two, the IRS expects 55,000 retirees in the next 10 years. These new agents would replace those folks. Three, the new hiring quota would be over 10 years rather than immediately. You know, that does change the big picture of that IRS hiring, doesn't it? John writes, I'm a CPA who has had this discussion multiple times a week with clients, and I've got to tell you, they look really dumb when I turn this around on them. Well, John, I always appreciate more information. And John does seem to know exactly what he's talking about. I'll keep that in mind when they pull the IRS talking points. Glorious Taco wrote in saying, shouldn't Abbott and DeSantis be arrested for those immigrant buses? David, in the past couple of months, Abbott and DeSantis have been sending busloads of illegal immigrants to various Northeast Democratic run cities, claiming that illegal immigration needs to be dealt with now. Shouldn't these two be arrested for knowingly transporting illegal aliens across state lines, a federal crime? And what money is being used to fund these trips if public funds should that be another federal crime? Yeah, we talked about this on Monday. NPR has a really good article about the possible illegality of the DeSantis migrant Martha's Vineyard stunt. I don't want to rehash everything I said. You can check out that clip. But GT, you are spot on in identifying there are a bunch of possible crimes there, a bunch of possible crimes. Anthony wrote in about Michael Cohen, Trump's former lawyer, and says, hey, David, I'm not sure if you addressed this before, but I've been listening to the Michael Cohen podcast and I noticed a couple times that he referenced you as the guy that goes to Trump rallies and talks to Trump supporters. I don't think he has the right guy unless you've been out there in which I'm sorry I even addressed this. I thought maybe he was thinking of Jordan Klepper or some other mockery type journals. Yeah, so Michael Michael Cohen's a great guy. We're in touch and He's a supporter of the show. We're going to have him back on soon. I like Michael Cohen. He sometimes refers to me as a comedian, which I'm glad to be called, although I'm about to show you a voice, an email that says I'm not funny. But to the extent that Michael Cohen finds me funny, I'm glad for him to call me a comedian. Michael Cohen has also said the guy that goes to Trump, Trump rallies. And when Michael Cohen interviewed legal analyst Asha Rangappa, Asha also said, I'm the guy that goes to the Trump rallies. So we've sent people to Trump rallies. We will also sometimes look at clips from Trump rallies. I don't know where it all came from. Your guess is as good as mine. Um, But I know exactly what you're talking about. Humor. Here is someone who doesn't like my humor or says I'm not funny. Like the show a lot, Dave, but find your humor a bit lacking. Not a complaint at all, but the dim sum word with Boebert cracked me up. She's in my district as Peter's in Mesa County. Trial date for Peters that was just set is six months from now. No lack of loons around here. Very much appreciate your efforts, uh, says Tom. You know, does it make sense to say that my humor is lacking when it's not a comedy show? I don't I don't know. I mean, it's sort of like if you said I didn't like uh, what's a really like hard boiled TV show kind of dark. I don't know. There's this there's actually a really good German uh, time travel show called Dark, and it is a dark show. It would be weird to say now the humor is lacking. It's not a comedy series. So I just don't know about this. My humor is lacking. It's not really meant to be a comedy show. So I don't know. Let me know what you think about what Tom has to say. Mike in New York City also wrote in. Mike said, David, I always found it hilarious that MAGA people think they're being clever by saying, let's go, Brandon, and that they think this bothers anyone on the left at all. I think Democrats should co op. You mean co opt should co opt the phrase. Let's go, Brandon. They should start chanting it in support every time Biden does something good. Yeah, I that would be funny. You know, a lot of times taking back the phrase is kind of silly. In this case, I think it would be funny for the left to also start using let's go, Brandon, as a positive. One of the cringiest things is when these right wingers, you can you see them and you can they think they're so smart and clever and incisive when they go, let's go, Brandon. And some of them email me and they'll say, David, can you tell Brandon to pay attention to his teleprompter or whatever, you know, that that type of thing. And they genuinely think they're being super clever 
it's cringy. The entire Let's Go Brandon thing is one of the cringiest out there. And the funniest part of it is how clever they think they are. They will never change. At least it uh, doesn't seem like it anytime soon. Make sure you are signed up for our bonus show. Oh, my clip isn't even playing. That was weird. It like came out of the wrong speaker. Anyway, you know, Alex Jones doesn't like the bonus show. Just remember that. To me, that's a great endorsement of the bonus show. Sign up at joinpacman.com and get instant access to that very same bonus show. We've got one coming up today right after the podcast.